I am now thrilled to introduce Reverend Jen Bailey, the moderator of today's conversation. You'll see Jen and all the speakers' incredible experience and honors in the chat box shortly. Reverend Bailey is an ordained minister, public theologian, and national leader in the multi-faith movement for justice. She is the founder and executive director of the Faith Matters Network, a womanist-led organization equipping community organizers, faith leaders, and activists with resources for connection, spiritual sustainability, and accompaniment. Jen is an alumna of IFYC, and I am honored and thrilled to hand this conversation over to her and our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and good afternoon everyone or good morning depending on where you are. It is my great honor to be able to help facilitate this conversation today on bridge building in a tumultuous time and I think so many of us are carrying into this conversation the reality of the news of the past week of the past year and for some of us our lifetimes. We are certainly I believe at um, a founding moment in American history. Um, the founding was not just something that happened in 1776, but it's my core belief that every generation has a new founding moment uh, and aspiring towards what America can be. And so I am so excited to be um, grounding this conversation with uh, the panelists that we have today who are phenomenal. I'm gonna give them just a brief introduction, but you'll be able to see their full bios in the chat. And so I'm so grateful to welcome to uh, this conversation today as co-conversation partners, Mandisa Thomas, who's the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated. Kalia Avide, who's the managing director for strategy and partnerships at the Pillars Fund. Simran Jeet Singh, a writer, teacher, scholar, and activist, who is the senior advisor for diversity and inclusion at YSC Consulting. And finally, Brandon S. Polk, who's a program officer at Stand Together and the Charles Koch Institute, focused on racial justice and courageous collaborations. To ground our conversation um, today, y'all can see I got a big old picture <laughs> in the back in back of me. This is a, about a five foot um, wide and large portrait of Frederick Douglass, who I consider one of our great American founders. And I thought to ground around our conversation today, I might share a few quotes from him about America that I've been holding close to me um, in this season of transformation. The first is this, that a battle lost or won is easily described, understood, and appreciated. That the moral growth of a great nation requires reflection as well as observation to appreciate it. The life of a nation is secure only while the nation is honest, truthful, and virtuous. And finally, it is not light that we need, but fire. It is not a gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. And so I offer those quotes from Frederick Douglass speaking to us from across the generations as a, as a way of framing this conversation around bridge building. And to get us started, um, I'm going to turn to you, Brandon, um, with this question, which is this, how has the concept of bridge building shifted or not shifted over the past week for you? Um, but thank you to the IFYC team for inviting me to be a part of this and Jen for moderating. Um, we, we lost you for one second, Jen, and then you were probably talking, but I just kept going. So hopefully that was all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, just give me my, my thanks and, and my gratitude for being here today. And so this, this question, I'm actually a little nervous to talk about. I actually haven't had a lot of time to process the events of last week, um, uh, maybe just from the busyness of trying to react and respond to what's been going on, right? So this is a, a moment just as we're, it's an authentic, vulnerable space I feel like I'm holding with you all right now to, to talk about it. Um, and I'll, I'll just start with answering the question with a little bit of context of, um, I, I live in Washington, DC. I've been here for 11 and a half years. I've spent 
a lot of time in the Capitol building over the course of those 11 and a half years and um, know that building really well um, uh, in ways that I never thought you know, that I would ever get the chance probably as a child or, or whatever to think that I would have such access, you know, to such a place um, at several parts during my career development. So um, there are two things, you know, that come to mind as reactions uh, from that. Um, as a citizen, I feel offended, of course, and uh, nauseous at the images, you know, that we could um, come to the place in our country where even that many people, you know, all at once, you know, could have that kind of um, feeling about the country or a lack of trust you know, with, within the government or about the government, and even more so to our founding principles, you know, that it would cause and strike this kind of violence. Um, uh, on the other side, as a Washingtonian who has spent a lot of time in and around the Capitol building, I feel it very personally, um, and it has, shook me in a way of, of asking this very question, Jen, you know, what, what does it mean to be a bridge builder? What does it mean to be a social healer? Um, and, you know, I've, as I've done all of this reflection, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that part of what we need to lean into, what we can lean into um, outside of the things that we know, um, we have to acknowledge the problem, right? These are things that we know. We know we have to go through processes of grief, things that we know. We know that um, there needs to be some kind of forgiveness or repentance um, in response, you know, to that offense, you know, as it comes about for all of us. And then we go about the business of reconciliation. What is something that that I've been thinking about in, in, in my own response, my own initial reaction to this is that I had a thought, I think like a lot of black and brown people did, which was if that were me, <laughs> you know, standing on those steps, right? Um, that would have been an entirely environment, a different kind of, or at least in my expectation that I would have been treated differently. And I don't say that to virtue signal in a certain direction, right? In one way or, or the other, but it is to say that that's the wound within me that got struck, right? It is a wound at the very base that actually says, hey, wait a minute, I, I can't trust that I would have been treated equally in this context, right? That is a fundamental problem. And it, it is a manifested generational wound that came in a thought. And what I feel like we need to inundate ourselves with or maybe include as a part of our bridge building language and practice is I think a concept of freedom. I love uh, the Frederick Douglass, you know, um, image really behind you, Jen, you know, is, is, is all, is, is bringing this up even more for me um, about freedom, but not only freedom from the external things that trigger us, right? Whether it's the things that happened last week, um, that thing that triggered that thought in me, but I'm thinking also of freedom from me, from myself, a freedom from the wound that is inside um, and has an origin. Um, and that that kind of personal transformation that needs to happen on the inside has to be a critical component, needs to continue to be a critical component um, of what um, the ideal state of bridge building and social healing needs to look like. Um, but this conversation, I feel like we have had at certain degrees, but you know, we, we have to consider really within ourselves, what is the conversation about ourselves and about our own wounds um, and then our collective wounds that are manifesting in this time. So. Um, I'm in and around the question, but um, it's it's been a hard week, you know, for all of us. But I think that while the language is not sufficient, it is what we have. And without parsing, I think that freedom is a really important thing that we can tie ourselves to as a core principle here. Thank you, Brandon. Anyone else want to hop in on this question? Yeah, I really appreciate your reflections, Brandon. And I think like, you know, when I think about freedom, and you also said something about like repentance and forgiveness. And I think about myself, you know, I'm Muslim. I raise, I'm raising my family I'm Muslim, but I grew up Catholic. And so I think about my eight-year-old self um, doing my first confession, right, before I could take communion. And that I had to, as a child, like think of something that I did wrong and admit that to a priest, right? So I had to think about that. And before I could expect any kind of redemption or forgiveness, right, 
even though like, you know, forgiveness and mercy come from God. So, right. But, but I still as a human had to go through the act of repenting. And that's something that I learned very young. And so I think, you know, the forgiveness has to be multi-directional. I think that the forgiveness that, you know, people of color and black people in particular in this country have been asked to grant over and over again is like akin to a divine forgiveness, right? And it's not that we shouldn't strive for that. We should strive uh, to have that in our hearts. But I also think we should forgive ourselves if we feel angry or if we don't feel like building a bridge, right? And I'm looking at my kids and they don't, they're like, build a bridge to what, right? So I have to allow that space for them and myself to like process all of these feelings before jumping to forgiveness. And I hear a lot of our elected leaders talking about it's time to heal, it's time to forgive and all of that. And I do think that there's a time and place for that conversation. But I think the grief that you mentioned and the anger that people feel should be allowed to be processed before we're forced into a reconciliation um, process. So I, I really am like just tapping into my eight-year-old self right now and that feeling, you know, can we do that as a country? Can we look ourselves in the face and be really honest about the sins of this country and like what we have to um, actually grapple with. Um, this is Mandisa, if I may jump in for a moment. Um, I'm going to take a bit of more of a historical, um, put this more in a historical context for a moment. Um, when we think of the words insurrection and sedition, um, I think uh, first of the um, Wilmington insurrection in which there were innocent black folks who were murdered. And even taking it back to Frederick Douglass, who in his 1852 oration denounced pro-Christian slavery. And when we look at these people who stormed the Capitol and they were touting their religious beliefs. We are talking about Christian nationalism and people who are who are doing this in, in the name of what they thought was good and probably against other Christians. And so this is something that we cannot ignore that has happened. This is a collective pain that and I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit more direct and honest about the pain that our communities have had to endure for years. And it also calls into question, again, how, quote unquote, good these Christians are. And so this is something that as a community that we have been, it's been the elephant in the room for so long as to actually challenging these beliefs and how good they're supposed to be, especially if they can be used to commit harm and, com and to commit atrocities, uh, people who believe in the same God. So it doesn't mean that there aren't, pe there aren't pe good people who do believe in God. However, when we're talking about these beliefs and, and, and the people who commit these actions, especially historically and institutionally towards people of color, and we see this time and time again, many of us were not surprised because we've seen this play out over and over again over, over um, centuries. And so there comes a time where uh, we say enough is enough. And when is justice going to be served? When are these people who actually commit these atrocities and commit these crimes actually going to be held accountable for what they do? And hopefully we are in a time now where this will actually happen as opposed to there just being this sense of, well, they perhaps there was a reason there was no good reason for it none whatsoever and this is the honesty that we have to process and 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 have to come to terms with and i don't think there's anything wrong with that especially given the history yeah i appreciate that and i think i mean everything everyone said so far i'll, I'll echo and and, and Mindy, so especially what you just said i think that's emotionally right right where where I am and where a lot of us are right now. So, so thank you for saying what you said. Um, I guess for me, what I'm trying to wrap my head around um, in this moment is, it, it really picks up on what you're saying, Brandon. It's this idea of cool, bridge building sounds fine, but then what, right? Like we have this idea that, um, or at least the way that, that our popular discourse is shaping up, it's, 
it's let's create bridges so we're not so polarized, right? Like let's meet in the middle, let's see one another's humanity. And I think that's great, but it tells us how far underwater we are right now, right? Like if if the bare minimum, and, and this is something that I experience as, as a sick on the street, right? Like part of part of what I try and do and perform when I walk by strangers is to let them see my humanity, right? So I'm like wearing my basketball Spurs jersey or whatever. And they're like, oh, that, that that's like a normal person, right? And like, think about what that says about where we are, that we are so far behind that we're not, we're not talking about freedom. We're not talking about liberation. We're not talking about justice. We're talking about seeing one another's humanity, right? That's, that's where we are. And I, I, I don't want to discount the importance of doing that work because this is what Mendes is talking about. Like our lives are on the line if we're not doing, doing this bridge building. But if we limit our imagination to the bridge, um, and to seeing one another's humanity, it's just another way of saying what we've been saying for forever, right? Like we've, we've talked about tolerance and then, you know, we come back and say tolerance is not enough. We have to do more. Well, this is, I mean, this is the same thing to me, right? Like you want to see my humanity? Cool. But then let's go do something together, right? Like let's, let's get justice together. Let's get equality. Like that hasn't existed. We haven't experienced that. And so to me, yes, there is a need for this work. Bridge building is critical. Uh, our lives are on the line. So it's a matter of life and death, but it's more, right? It has to be more. And until it's more, it, it won't be satisfying for, for any of us. Even if we, even if we tell ourselves that's the goal. And I'll just say one last thing. It reminds me of our conversations around representation and diversity and inclusion, where so often we say, all we want is to see ourselves on the screen. All we want is a book that has a character like us. All, all we want is to show up in, in an administration so people can see that we exist. But then what, right? Like that, that's not how power works. That's not how justice works. So, so we delude ourselves into thinking that's what we want. And then when we get there, we have a bitter taste in our mouths because it's, it's really not getting us the results we need. And so, yeah, just, just trying to echo what all of you are saying, because I think it's, it's right on point. Can I just add, just to, just to top that off, um, and you're hinting at it, actually being really explicit about it, is that it's really hard for us to articulate the ideal state of what bridge building produces. Um, so as a field, I think we need to shed ourselves of the fear <laughs> of actually coming to the table with those conversations. Um, and I think that fear is that we're not going to align on what the ideal state should be, right? Or we know that we're not going to align <laughs> on what the ideal state should be. So we avoid it entirely. And that also puts us into this fissure, right? You know, where we're moving away from one another in the language of bridge building, so long as people align, right? And so we, we have to do a better job, I think, of wading into the fields of vulnerability and honesty here, to Mandisa's point, about what does it mean um, for redemption to be manifested, you know, what does it mean for reconciliation to be manifested? What does it mean for bridge building to actually produce um, collaborations and cooperation that solves problems that are seemingly like impossible to surmount, right? Um, but that that will um, uh, to actually do that cooperation and to solve those problems, we know that we need to do it together, that there's an energy um, towards solving problems when we do it in symphony with people across difference, but then we still have to articulate what that means and what that looks like. And that is so hard. Um, and especially when you cross over in, into areas of like retaliation and coercion, and if you don't see it the same way that I do. So I think we have an interesting balance here, but I think we have to take a step in as I'm excavating this, just listening to all of you, that we need to go in that much deeper. And the signal is here. Right, we've seen all of the signs, right, for years, right, that the culminating event, right, of last week, rather it was a culminating event, right, it wasn't a singular thing, and it, and we can't point the finger at to the left or to the right any longer, but rather point the finger on the inside, which is what my mama used to tell me, right, you know, if you're gonna point the finger, recognize you have three fingers pointing back at you, kind of thing, you know. So I think we have to do a lot of that work and not shirk ourselves from acknowledging. Um, what people are feeling, um, our understandings of history, um, a generational understanding of what we're want, wanting to like impart to the next generation is really important here as well. And um, because I'll be dead and the work will have to continue because this, this is a long game kind of thing, so. 
my grandmother used to make that noise that mm, noise when something was getting good and she was cooking and tasting <laughs> and I feel like we're cooking up something delicious right now in this conversation. Um, thank you. I want to just name, thank you, Mandisa, for naming Wilmington. I think people don't know the history of the Wilmington coup, one of the only successful coups in American history where um, Black-led government in Wilmington, North Carolina was unseated because of an insurrection of white supremacists. Um, so again, part of this feels like an act of recovering parts of our history that we haven't remembered or have been intentionally forgotten. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Simran, for beginning to interrogate this metaphor of the bridge. But I think that, that guides us really nicely to our, our next question, which is, does bridge building still feel like the right language to describe the work of coming together that's needed now? I think we've begun to hint at some of this in our responses to the last question, but I wonder, Kalia, if you might um, help us unpack that question a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I'm interested in interrogating all of the language we're using right now. <laughs> every, every one of it, you know, in a former career, I was a copy editor and I just kind of want to take my old school red pen and just strike through it all and, and start over. Um, so for me, no, it's really unsatisfying in this moment today. I might feel differently tomorrow, but like the feelings are raw right now. And, and no, like, um, and I think it's partly because, you know, over this last week, we keep hearing and we hear this time and time again, you know, we are better than this. This is not who we are. And I want to know who we is, first of all, right? That's a question. I know I'm not the only one asking that when it comes up in Twitter or wherever else, like, you know, but I hear it, that this is not who we are. And I'm like, yeah, you know, and I think, um, and I also, you know, some, one of you, I think, Brandon, you just mentioned, like, what are we imparting to the next generation? Um, I want it to be constructive. I want it to be like, it feel fruitful. I want it to feel hopeful. So I don't want to send my children or, you know, this generation, my nieces, my nephews, my neighbors, um, young people into this space, not prepared for what it is they're going to be up against as they're trying to heal and bridge build and all of that. Like, and I feel like, you know, my generation, we were still taught this really fantastical story about this mythical land um, where everyone, you know, overcame so many things. And, you know, you could be a kid sitting in an all black classroom, but you're hearing about, you know, how we desegregated the schools. Well, my high school wasn't desegregated until 10 years before I was born, right? So that history was there. My classmates, you know, had parents who went to segregated schools and for all intents and purposes in the nineties, my schools were still segregated, right? Even though legally that wasn't what was happening. So. I want us to, before we can even talk about bridge building, I just want to unpack all these other words that we keep using to describe the situation that we're in. And I'm thinking about, you know, James Baldwin saying, the horror is that America changes all the time without ever changing at all. And I find ourselves like kind of just back in this place over and over again. And so how do we get out of that cycle? And you know, do we have the right language? It is language. I feel like language is very foundational. And, and one more thing that I'll add, Simran, you mentioned um, this act of humanizing that we do when we go out in the world, like we're humanizing ourselves. We're trying to make ourselves palatable to other people. And I'm also tired of that, right? So I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna have to be perfect in this bridge building process. I wanna show up with my flaws as well if we're confronting the flaws of this country and the flaws of the language that we use and all of that, I don't want to have to show up. Uh, I don't want any of us to have to show up perfect. Being human means that we can be good and nice and friendly, but also like not be right all the time and not be perfect and not be held um, to an impossible standard. So I don't think that really answers the, the question of what is the right language, but I don't feel like what we have right now is sufficient. Yeah, I'll uh, completely agree. Um, here again, I, I'll, I'll just say it. I'm trying to parse before we move, of course, and no one's saying that here. We have to continue to do the work of bridge building, quote unquote, or social healing, quote unquote. Um, but I completely agree that there's insufficiency in, in our language anyway. <laughs> um, and therefore is insufficiency in the word bridge and then bridge and build, right? 
and then I would add, um, you know, if I ask myself, you know, what am I uh, prone to, to do um, or how am I primed to behave in this culture right now? It's, to, it's toward achievement um, and it's toward um, some kind of acceptance through manipulation, right? And I'm talking about me personally, right? So um, I, am, um, I have to go to work and I have to achieve and then I will be rewarded, right? I get on social media, I say something, I get likes, I'm rewarded, right? Um, in my family, if I had a family, and this is not the case in my family, I had a very, very loving family who did not force me to go into certain professions, but imagine that I had to achieve in a certain way to become a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, right? So we are primed for these things that actually take us away from a singular concept, I think that we all want as a, and, and need. Um, it, it is in fact a fundamental need for belonging, and connection um, that cannot be extricated, you know, from the work of bridge building. Someone, you 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 mentioned this that the the bare minimum, of course, is tolerance, and maybe seeing one another as humans and treating each other with respect and dignity, and then nonviolence, right? You know, these are the bare minimums. My mom would also say to me that you do not get a cookie <laughs> for making your bed in the morning because that is your job, <laughs> right? So um, in the same sense, I don't need to be rewarded, should not be rewarded for treating people with dignity, right? Um, and with respect. And I think that's sometimes what we're looking for is that extra, you know, cherry on top of the whipped cream or whatever it is that says, hey, look what I did. I built a bridge here and we did this program. And I'm thinking most people are going to work every day trying to put food on the table, right? They're trying to figure out where they fit in the story. And I think what that means is that we're tired and fatigued of needing to fit in, right? With whatever this narrative is or whatever the picture of the ideal for someone else might be for us, right? For me or for us or for each other. But that we need to then somehow build a pluralistic society that will allow me to belong here and to connect here. Um, and those are a lot of words that we can't put into a whole movement like bridge building, belonging, social connecting. I mean, you know, like that's just a long word for a field. So I'll, I'll just end with this and just say that we have a need, I think, for um, some guiding principles on what it means to be in this movement, right? To be, um, uh, uh, and, and I've sort of called it akin, you know, to the Hippocratic oath, right? You know, where you take an oath to do no harm, right? Or something like that, you know, that, that gives us some sense of, of what we're striving for um, and something that we can hold each other accountable to. Um, I think I went, before, I went before Simran last time, so I wanted to give him the opportunity to kind of go <laughs> before me. <laughs> Is he still there? I'm here, but yeah, you oh, okay. go for it. I think, yeah, I'd rather hear what you have to say. Okay, so um, when I think of bridge building, um, I, I see that there's a lot of words. You know, there's, it, it, you know, we, we look at the word, we look at the words and language, but I tend to look at the actions. You know, there's often a lot of people who talk about what it means to come together, and this also makes me think of Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, in which. Um, the you know many of his white colleagues criticized him for being too what they considered radical and he was explaining to them that you know there has been this soft approach for far too long and there's been a lot of pretty language but there are a lot of people who are angry and there's a lot of you know there is the action or, or there people are seeing that you know, these leaders are saying stuff or people are saying it, but the actions don't correspond well. And people are starting to see that. People can see through that. And when we talk about um, preparing our children and preparing future generations, uh, we must be careful that our actions do correspond with our words always, and that we are being genuine and consistent, that they aren't just one-time efforts, that they actually continue beyond what's in the press as well, or when it's a trending topic, because that's when the real work is done. That's when the real bridge building is done. It's done in the, you know, when it's tedious and boring, and most of us are, we're, we're primed to wanna see action 
right away. And people don't realize that these institutions took time to build. They will take time to dismantle and bridges take time to build as well. And it's hard work. It's not just pretty lofty language. And I think that's what many people are used to. And um, getting more of us used to there being such hard, that is hard and that it can be challenging at times. And there are times where you don't want to do it. You won't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so, but when it gets hard is when it's the most needed. And, and I think it's very important that our actions make sure that we make sure that our actions continue to align with what we say. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And that's, it's not along the lines of what I was going to say, but I want to, I want to just um, pick up on that because I think it's so critical. Um, I, you know, the, what Kalia was saying earlier in terms of the exhaustion that comes with uh, doing this work, um, especially for black folks, people of color who have been doing this their whole lives. And it's been generational as, as Brandon keeps reminding us. Um, it is, it is tough work and it's easy to, to give up on it or at least want to give up on it and, and to get burnt out by it. Right. And so the question for me then becomes why do it in the first place right like why why do we show up uh and part of it is is this survival instinct right like we do it because we love our kids and we want them to have better lives right they don't want to we don't want them to have to deal with what we went through just in the same way that our parents did that for us right and so there's there's that instinct of of uh, of protection and and preservation at, at work here but also if I think about my parents and, and, and I think about now that I'm a parent, why I do this work for my kids, um, it's, it's driven not out of fear, right? Like survival doesn't have to be fear-based. Uh, survival can be love-based, right? You can do these things out of love. And, and when that happens, at least in my experience, the, the nature of your relationship with the work completely flips. Right. So like, just, just let me, I'm a runner and I'll give you an example. Like if I'm running out of fear of someone chasing me, right. And that's, that's happened. I hate it. I hate it. And I'm exhausted when I'm done and I wish it never happened. But if I'm running because it's a marathon and I've been training and I've been practicing and I just do it for fun, it's different, right? The entire experience is different. And I'm, I mean, I'm tired at the end of it. It's still work. It's not that it's any easier. But your, your relationship with the experience is completely flipped. And so to me, it, 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 I, I take it back to, I had this moment of insight uh, reading James Baldwin, as, as it sounds like we all, we all have insights when we read James Baldwin. Uh, but he said this thing that completely changed my life. Um, he said, if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. And to me, that's the work of bridge building, right? I don't do it because... I hate people, and if I was doing it for that reason, I I, I don't think I'd last very long. Uh, but I do it out as an act of love for myself and for my kids and for the people I'm trying to connect with. And then the bridge is entirely different, right? And my relationship with it is entirely different. So just just trying to pick up on some of the threads that other folks are saying. But yeah, Mindy said thank you for for taking me down that path because it's it's really productive for me. Oh, that's so good. Um... So I'm hearing a, a lot of words around value, right? So things that we value, whether that be love or forgiveness, repentance, redemption, accountability <laughs> might be another word that emerges for us. And so uh, our next question is around values and commitment, but I'm gonna bundle this with uh, a question from the audience. And so for folks who are joining us on Zoom or Facebook, feel free to chat over any questions that you might have for the panelists. But Mindy, so you were going to kick us off, and this question is actually for you, and I think folds nicely into this question around commitments. Um, and this is from, I believe, Talia Carroll, who says, how might you suggest, Mandisa, that we encourage those who have the words but are altogether misaligned in their actions? Does it go back to what Brandon said about appeasement, acceptance, and belonging? I'm thinking so, but would love your perspective. So I'm, I'm bundling all that together because I feel okay. like <laughs> awesome. So as a um, as an openly identified atheist and also a humanist, I'm going to read the one of the definitions for humanism, which is it is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to leave ethical lives of personal. And I'm also going to add collective fulfillment 
that aspire to the greater good. So my humanism is informed, one, by how I was raised, also what I see institutionally, and also what I have learned from uh, my family, my peers, and my teachers and such. And I really want, and my thing is, I really want to do good for the sake of being good. Not because there might be some divine reward, because we have to be honest that there are a lot about many people who may think they're doing the right thing because there may be some reward in it for them. And Unfortunately, that does speak to self-gratification that many people may not even realize that they're perpetuating. And it's okay to want something a bit for ourselves to be personally fulfilled. But if we want to leave this world in, in, a, better, in, a, better, uh, um, in, a, in a better shape than how we, we, we inherited it, or, or even if we want to continue it for those who, you know, who, who had it very well, if we want to continue to develop it, it must go beyond ourselves. And um, my, my thing is, I want the same rights I would want for myself and my family, I would want for everyone else, regardless of what they do or regardless of the perspectives that they share, even if there are some things that we don't agree on or and, and, and such, you know, um, I, I think that that is absolutely important. And again, it goes back to um, the question about how we recognize uh, that commitment to action is it, to, it, it takes a consistency and also a self-reflection. It's hard for many of us to be honest with ourselves about the mistakes we make. And it's okay, you know, like, like Brandon mentioned vulnerability, that's a part of it. And for many of us, it can be difficult because we, you know, we don't want to be told that we're doing something wrong, right? <laughs> but, but again, that is that space where correction and improvement is needed and that learning is an everyday process. We don't stop learning once we become adults especially once we become adults. And as we become parents, I have three children. All of my children are now, and they're young adults and teenagers. And so my boys now who are preteens and teenagers, this is a very, and they're black boys, right? So we are talking about what, what the world is gonna be like for them in the future and how they're going to prepare for it. And especially, and I'm in the state of Georgia, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from New York, but you know, Georgia just flipped blue. You know, we just um, elected um, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. So we're looking at this new administration as it becomes more progressive and in that state. So see, knowing that they're seeing this and knowing that our children are seeing this, showing, showing that, um, that there has been a commitment to change and that it does have to be consistent and it's something that has to become routine it isn't something that has it isn't there isn't a magic you know there, there isn't it isn't something that we have to continue to wonder what it's about is that it's it's what we must continue to do and i think all of us here on on this webinar are humanists um whether we're secular humanists or religious humanists and I, I think we can all agree on that. And, and I think once we, once we can establish that, it is the goal of a collective and a community in mind, then we can better start piecing these things together and improving on them. To uh, join in as the mom of three black sons too, you know, that, I also want them to see me doing it for myself too, right? Um, but I do, I can't deny that, you know, that's the, the thought process that goes into this every day. And I think something we do with kids too is wait and, oh, we'll have that conversation later. We'll have that conversation when they're older. We're not ready for it. And, you know, in our experience, it's like, let's just talk about it now at the, um, you know, level, the appropriate levels, but like, why wait? And I remember my oldest son being about three and his little, one of his friends described him as black and his mom like shushed him, like, shh, don't call him black. It's like, and I was like, it's fine. That's, 
he is right? like, and I want him to accept that about himself. And I want, you know, that, but I think we shush, right. We don't have all the answers. So we're like, ah, oh, we'll talk about it later. Ah, it feels too complicated. It will hurt too much. And I think we can start to establish trust with our children if we are open and honest and vulnerable with them too. And say, I don't know, like, I don't actually, I don't know why you're seeing these inconsistencies, but you know what, let's, try to you know work on them together let's find the good examples and i remember having a group of activists over for dinner once and my son adam being able to see that with his own eyes so when he came back to it and you know we're here in chicago and i don't i won't make this story too long but the long and short of it was there were you know it was dark there were police officers and everything descending on the city because the video of laquan mcdonald being shot was about to be released so there was just this tension in the air. And my kid had heard about it at school before I had a chance to talk to him. And so he freaked out and he was just like, who is gonna, like, who's protecting me? Like, who's trying to change this? And I was able to point to this group of people that he happened to be able, he had the fortune to see in his house. And I said, you know, these are some of the people working on it. You heard the conversations that they were having. And he's like, they don't even know my name. And I was like, one, they do know your name, but two, like there are people, you know, around the country, around the world who are doing this work day in and day out. And having that sort of tangible example for him at uh, maybe nine or 10 years old was so helpful to see, like, there are people who care. There are people who want to like, just wrap you in their love and their like purpose, um, even if they don't know your name. So I just, I, you know, I don't want to only talk about the kids because I think we have a responsibility as adults, whether we're parents or not, whether we interact with children or not, but they have to see us doing this for ourselves as well. And, um, you know, if we are talking about faith, I, and I was reading one of the comments here, you know, I, I always think back to that, just this concept of like faith without works being dead, you know, we have an obligation to just put one foot in front of the other and to interrogate our intentions and, um, you know, to plant whatever seeds we can, even if we won't be able to see the fruits of them um, down the line. So I just really appreciate y'all, like just sort of holding this space with you guys and getting to, to think about what those seeds are. I love all of that. I just have one thing that's come to mind that's generating coming up to the top, also a, a biblical reference in James 5, 17, you know, that says that we should confess our sins one to another and pray for one another so that we might be healed. And what I find is really interesting about it, you know, I think that there are like remnants, you know, of, of uh, evangelicalism that have taken that verse and created accountability programs, right? You know, like, you know, if you get together and you just tell me what you're going through and the sin in your life, then you'll experience healing, right? And the confessional part of that is, is really great, but we miss the and pray for one another part of that right? Which is about connection and the quality of the connection. So if I confess something in the confessional, right, that I'm dealing with X, Y, or Z, but there is not a quality of place, right, where, where that connection can take place, then I miss the opportunity for healing, even though I expect it, then I become disgruntled and angry and upset that the healing didn't happen, right? And I think that this is one of the things that we need to pass to our kids. I have a 10-year-old nephew. I don't have any children. I have several godchildren. I do that on purpose so I can give them away, right? Like I have my good time and then I give them back. Um, and what I always do with them, and I had an experience actually right after, you know, the 2016 election, 2017, right after the inauguration, I was in a city in America, a very well-known city in America. And then I went into our marshals and was called the N-word by a stranger. And I then go home and I have to process. I go, so, so what do I do with this information, right? Um, what do I do with this experience, you know? And at the time, you know, my nephew was probably eight or nine, you know, but I've continued to sort of get not down on his level, but just at his level of conversation, right? And say, here's the thing I want to confess to you, right? About my own life and things that I've experienced. And here's a really um, safe and qualitative place for you to connect with me, where you know I'm being humble, right, in coming to you, and I want you to hold this information, but I'm here for you, right, and we have to go through this healing together. I think this is something that this generation, not the 10-year-olds, 
as much as maybe the 17 year olds, 18 year olds, you know, 20 somethings who are in college, right? And who are, you know, I remember when I was in college, it was like, you know, like give me something I can raise my fist to, right? And you want that mission and you want that purpose. And 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 what's happened is that especially for faith groups or, you know, um, uh, or, 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 or groups that would consider themselves, you know, coming from a faith root, those um, places don't exist as much anymore, or we don't trust them as much anymore. And so for the younger generation, what did they have? You know, I mean, there are very isolated places that are in the online spaces, or it's when they go to work or when they go to school, right? It's not groups. It's not church as much anymore because less people are going to organize church, right? I'm in the online space right now, listen to my Georgia pastors from DC, like I'm doing that, you know? And so is everyone else. So it's important that I, I think that, that we dive even deeper on excavating what the opportunities are to create something, right? A safer space, a quality of space where a connection can happen for this generation, um, for the next generation. Um, Ronald Reagan, I think, said it this way that freedom is only but one generation away from becoming extinct right and that's the um that is the energy and the urgency that i think that we need to approach this with you know and i think that we can see it like we see the evidence right that we're just on a knife's razor edge right of being of losing all of the things that we even in this field or on on this call in this webinar that we fight so hard to maintain right and 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 to keep the embers burning but we have to put the fire and impart that fire in um, with quality and with principles into the next generation. That's such a good transition, Brandon. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and we got three questions from the audience. That's how good this conversation is. Folks are, are wanting to engage you all. And so I thought I would bundle by just asking all of those questions at once and whoever would like to jump in to answer them. But one thing that seems consistent across all three is that they are action oriented. So as we're thinking about and you said creating something together. I think they all fit into that category. Um, the first question um, is from Sarah Smith, who's a Lutheran pastor and professor. And she says, in some Christian traditions, a sacrament equals a promise plus a concrete element. So for example, baptism equals water plus the promise of enoughness. What is needed in our nation could be called sacramental, words plus bridge building and concrete actions. And so like bridge building and concrete actions. So I'm curious um, for you all, what are the, what is that balance of words plus something that is emerging in this season? Um, the second question is from Nestor Hernandez, who's a student at the University of Laverne in Southern California, who's wondering what strategies you in particular on the panel will be utilizing as you continue your work of personal and social healing. So what's coming up for you? What's on your, on the docket for you, as it were, um, as you look forward? And then a final question from Facebook about advice for moving forward um, and acting together in a world where we are still in the midst of a global pandemic, <laughs> a remote world, um, in which, in particular, a remote world in which media and information infrastructure is so segregated. So how do we go about doing the work, whatever the work is, whatever language we want to use to articulate the work in a world with where we're getting lots of different information? Information from a lot of different places. So that's an open, I know we got 10 minutes y'all, so <laughs> jump in wherever, you, get in where you fit in, as my, as my auntie used to say. <laughs> well, I think Simran should have the opportunity. I don't, I don't think he had a chance to respond last time, so uh, maybe he should start. Oh, sure. No, I, I didn't have anything special to add after after what you all said, but I uh, appreciate that. I mean, I'll I'll just give a quick response and, and, and leave the rest to you all. I think um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to try and quickly um, get, give a give a perspective um, that that might address all three questions at once, because they, they don't look similar on the face. Uh, but I think there's something really similar going on, at least in, in, in my head, in, in terms of how I'm thinking about them. Um, so, so as a scholar of religion, it's part of my contract that I have to mention Foucault at least once every time I, every time I'm on a panel. So, so Foucault, here we go. Um, he has this concept that's been really helpful to me, uh, called the regimes of truth. And what he means by that is there are times in society, in human history, where people are operating on entirely different sets of facts. 
right? Entirely different realities. When things become so polarized, and I think you'll see why this is relevant for us right now, when things are so polarized that the entire understanding of the world between you and me is different, right? There, there's no firm footing. And, and this is where an analogy of bridge building might be helpful again, right? What does it take for me to come from where I am and meet you where you are? And, and the bridge is truth. But the challenge is how do we get there when we're so polarized that we're just going like this, right? Like there's nothing that, that brings us together. And so for me, as I'm looking at this um, and, and as I've experienced it in the world, like facts, facts aren't the answer, right? Like we, we are the most educated society in human history. We have more college graduates than ever before and, and look where we are, right? Like our educations aren't going to solve this. There's something else that we need. And, and for me, at least what I've found is if, if someone says something hateful to me on the street and I respond with a, a lecture on the history of Sikhism, <laughs> doesn't do anything, right? Like, doesn't change their minds. But if I can meet them where they are with their values, then we, we're having an entirely different conversation. Because while our regimes of truth might be different, right, like our foundational understandings of the world might be different and what's going on, we can meet on our values, right? Like every person wants generally the same things, right? They want to be happy. They want to feel safe. They want their kids to feel safe. They want to feel loved. And so how can we meet people with their values in a way that might help them? I think this is where Mendes's point really helps, right? Like that might demonstrate that they are out of, out of whack in terms of their, what they say and what they believe and what they actually do. Right, like no one, no, no one, and, and you look at these white nationalists, like they'll, they'll be the first ones to tell you we're not racist. And so like you point at them and you say, and, and if they're the ones saying they're not racist, then who's going to confess to being, nobody, nobody's gonna say it. But if you can say, hey, the way you're saying this, the way you're doing this is misaligned with your values and our shared values, then you're having a different conversation. So to me, uh, and this is, you know, finally getting to your question, Nestor, what, what am I trying to do? How, how is this conversation driving me into the future? That's it, right? Like, how do, I, how do I reveal to people, and going back to Baldwin, how do I help them see the things that they are unable to see and don't want to see, right? And, and again, it's not, it's not through facts. It's through that personal connection. And I think that's, that's what I'm hearing from a lot of the folks here. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. When I saw Nestor's uh, question, I thought about, you know, relationships before task. Everything feels so urgent right now. Um, I feel like we have to act, act, act. But I do think, you know, where we don't have those strong relationships, we need to take the time to build them. because so we're not going to fix it before the inauguration. <laughs> uh, we're not going to fix it before the next election. So just sort of, you know, making sure that those relationships are strong. And then I'm also thinking this is, strategy, but it's not, right? It's an ongoing practice. Like, what are we taking in? And I think, you know, I would love to have a whole conversation with you for about Baldwin, just in general, because I feel like we've all dropped him in here and there. But, you know, is, is what I'm taking in challenging me? Or do I feel comfortable in it? And I think when I start to just feel comfortable in what I'm reading, what I'm learning, then I know I need to, like, you know, keep doing what feels good, but also push myself. So I say the same is true for the conversations that we're having with people. If you're finding yourself continuously in conversations where you're not being pushed in any way, maybe just, you know, take a little step outside of that circle and feel um, feel challenged. And I think, you know, we've, we've all talked a little bit about how exhausting this work is. And if you're able to have one of these bridge building conversations and you feel, you know, I, I think we want to leave feeling energized, but if you don't feel a little bit of the weight of it, <laughs> Right? You don't feel a little bit tired, a little bit overwhelmed, right? Like you don't sense the gravity of this, then I would interrogate that a little bit. Um, so that's not a tactic. That's not something that can be, you know, that's not a KPI for a strategy. But I do think that's part of how you know it's being successful, right? Is when you feel, when you feel different, uh, when you feel pushed, when you feel challenged a little bit. Yeah, I'll be brief um, in terms of just acknowledging sacrament, baptism, activation, action. Um, I think sort of hints at that thing that I was saying earlier about confession to connection to healing, you know, and it is important that 
we look at the dimensions or excavate the different layers of what healing looks like or what it can manifest itself in. Um, but one of the ways in which, um, you know, we are looking at this right now is actually through, um, similar in what you were talking about in terms of principles and values, right? So, and even to be more crass and difficult <laughs> is American values and principles, right? And actually doing a dive here on, um, can we invoke King here <laughs> where he says, I have a dream and it is rooted deeply in the American dream and how in the articulation of that and the oration of that, he's holding everyone in the country, leaders, laity, whoever it is accountable to reaching the high standard without denying that we haven't met the standard, right? So we're in the business right now of acknowledging that we haven't met the standard as a country. And we need to have a deeper conversation about whether or not, not just what those values are, but if we're still wanting to attain to them, if we still believe in them. Frederick Douglass, notwithstanding, right, said that these principles of the American experiment are saving principles, right? So I thought it was, it's really interesting because if we invoke Frederick now, <laughs> right, then this is going to cause some heartburn for many people when it comes to actually thinking with all the hurt and all the pain, can I actually put faith in this experiment again, where there has been a lot of lost faith? So that's one thing, but I think we have an opportunity in the context of the current cultural moment, right, where everything that happens, there is a lens of race or racism or um, like oppression or, or, or whatever language we use around that, right? That, that that is the lens through which most people are looking in one way or another um, at these events that are happening, whether it's Joe Biden's election, whether it's impeachment, whether it's, we're all looking through the lens of race in some way. And I think that there's something that's strategically significant there where we can leverage this moment to have the conversations that we need to have around bridge building in different ways, right? Or working with one another um, really across differences, giving those skills, those tools, those resources. So really involved in that process right now, hoping that there can be a field of bridge builders, right? Of social healers that's expanded and growing and, and, and just like yeast, you know, just growing all over the country of people that are committed to this. But also that we need those proof points, right? So. How are we navigating through issues of poverty and criminal justice reform? How are we navigating through the issues of um, uh, the, the red redlining problems that are going on in K through 12 ed, right? And segregation and education, right? We need proof points to the movement, right? That actually says that coming together across differences actually solves the problems, right? And I'm done. Sorry, I was long-winded. Yeah, I will just say real quick, I'm sorry, that um, as an advocate for evidence-based solutions, I think it's important for us to balance what we see. Some people think they have facts, but the evidence doesn't care about what you feel. The evidence doesn't care about what you believe. It cares about what's right. And more, and more people need to be caring about what's right based on the evidence that we have. So I will just say that in closing. I was going to say, Mindy, so that is the last word, a mic drop to, <laughs> to end this conversation on... Um, on behalf of IFYC, I just want to say thank you. I've been a part of a lot of bridge building conversations over the past four years, and this is by far one of the richest and most meaningful. So thank you for um, bringing your whole selves to this space.